Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Media Twist. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we're going to be talking about a deal which struck between Comcast and Netflix so that customers can get better service of Netflix, better picture quality, something that's been a problem on Comcast. And that deal brought a lot of net neutrality concerns. Um, does this mean that other providers of video will have to pay Comcast directly? Is this going to give Comcast more power? Um, and was this even about net neutrality? We have a great panel put together to talk about this subject. We have uh, Andrew Lee from American University joining us, as usual. We have Claire Groden, our MediaTwits intern, joining us. We have Dan Rayburn from Streaming Media Blog um, joining us as well. And Felix, Baron Felix von Salmon joining us from his uh, penthouse suite at Reuters. And Stacy Higginbotham from GigaOM also joining us to talk about this. Um, it seems like at the beginning this really was just a simple case of um, Netflix buying some better bandwidth, better throughput in order to serve customers on, on Comcast who weren't getting the best version of Netflix. They were getting kind of slow streaming. It really wasn't working very well. That led to a lot of charges that this deal was kind of the end of net neutrality. It was going to uh, make it very difficult for regulators. And with the net neutrality rules being thrown out in court, it really brought up a lot of issues. A lot of people were covering it. And then Dan Mayburn um, from Streaming Media kind of shot down a lot of those stories saying, really, this is just a business deal. This has nothing to do with net neutrality. Um, Dan, why don't you tell us just how you saw the story breaking and what some of the problems were and kind of the myth busting that you did. Aware that Netflix is currently delivering video three different ways. And what that shows is that there's a lot of different options in the market for delivering good quality video to the last mile to an ISP. So. Netflix simply made a business decision that they wanted to get into the CDN business and actually build out a CDN of their own. It's interesting that in 2007, uh, Netflix tried it before today. Um, in 2007, they built out their own CDN and it didn't work out for them, so they went back to rely on third-party CDN providers. So, so what what CDNs just for people who don't understand? So content, content sure, content delivery networks are companies like an Akamai, a Limelight, a Level Three, and Edgecast. If you go to CDNlist.com, you can see a list of providers in the market. They offer a service whereby content owners rent their servers and their infrastructure that they've put together to deliver video. So if you are PBS, if you're Fox, if you're Disney, if you're Major League Baseball, the NFL, all of these companies use content delivery networks 100% for all their video delivery. And what that enables is very good quality video delivery at a very cheap price because the CDNs are already connected to the ISPs like Comcast. What Netflix then did was decide that we're not going to rely on those third-party CDN providers as much anymore. We're going to go out and get our own servers, start an open connect program, launch a platform, build this all ourselves, and then try and work with ISPs to interconnect our CDN to theirs. And so what, um, in doing that, does that, what does that mean that they're cutting out? I mean, is this, is this about the CDNs, like Cogent, I think, was one of them, that just wasn't really providing the service that, um, that Netflix needed, um, that they weren't paying on to Comcast the money required to give them a better service? Was this really about bad service from Cogent more than it is about Netflix or Comcast? Well, yes, for one thing, but, but keep in mind Cogent is not a CDN. Cogent is a transit provider, and this is where a lot of the confusion comes in is people understanding the difference between CDN and transit, what is peering, settlement-free peering, paid peering, interconnections. There's a lot of you know, moving pieces on the technical side, but basically the way it worked was Netflix has their own servers that sit in third-party data centers. Those third-party data centers, Netflix then buys transit from companies like Cogent, Level 3, there, there's quite a few that they buy transit from. Those transit providers are charging Netflix for a service. Netflix is buying a certain amount of capacity and, and a certain amount of guarantee of that capacity from Cogent. Cogent then it goes to the ISP and says to the ISP, we want to take all this traffic that we're getting from our customer who's paying us and push it into your network, and we want as much capacity 
you know, that we're asking for and we don't want to pay you anything. And some of that is okay because that's what's called settlement free peering. So if you go to Comcast.com slash peering, you can read Comcast publicly available peering guidelines. If another company wants to peer with them and they follow those guidelines, it's free. But if you want to push a ridiculous amount of traffic to any ISP and it's outside of their peering guideline, there is a cost to do that. That is simply how the internet has worked for 20 years. That's what transit providers do. But Cogent has a history of having problems basically with just about every ISP out there. And if you even just Wikipedia Cogent, one of the first things you see is a list of nine different peering disputes they've had over the years with AOL, with Level 3, with, you know, the list is, is long. So this is simply Cogent basically oversubscribing something that they've charged Netflix for, and as a result, they want Comcast to fix it. Fair enough. Now, Stacy, you've been on this story pretty much from the beginning. You've written a bunch of posts for GigaOM about it. Um, has your thinking changed at all on this story? I mean, initially it seemed like it was about net neutrality, then it wasn't, but it still seems like there's something about these two big players connecting that has kind of resonated with a lot of people who don't don't feel it just doesn't feel right. There's something there's something that just doesn't smell right about this deal. Do you do you think that's still the case? I think the biggest issue here is what a competition at the last mile. Um, everything that Dan said is is true, and it is. Hearing interconnections, these are all very complicated. But for most people who look at this deal, they say to them, what they see is Netflix traffic degrading during prime time on Comcast Network. They don't understand why. Um, so both parties in this, this disagreement have been using the consumer kind of as a, as a bargaining chip. Consumer pain is a bargaining chip. And that, that's been what I've been writing about. So it's it is not a net neutrality issue in the legal sense of net neutrality. Um, but it is an issue where Netflix is saying is, is sending traffic via cogent. And Comcast would Comcast has told me that you know Netflix is sending all of their traffic through cogent and they're not, you know, they're not going through other sources that are less congested in order to cause a problem for the end consumer. Um, kind of as a bargaining chip to make the consumers call Comcast and be like, my Netflix doesn't work. Um, if you talk to Netflix, they'll say that Comcast won't, you know, will limit them and where they can peer and, and it's putting all these crazy restrictions on it. So it's very much a he said, she said on the back end. Um, but at the core of this is the consumers have no choice. The consumer doesn't know what's going on with their crappy, their crappy video stream. And it's not like they can switch from Comcast you know, to Verizon, which you wouldn't want to do anyway because Verizon's having the same issues. But so so that's my big concern is at the end of the day, consumers are having a crappy experience. They don't know who to go to to complain. And they really can't change it. Do you think, Andrew, what's your take on looking at this? I mean, you've also been kind of delving into this yourself. Um, do you feel like this is an issue that, you know, Netflix just needed to provide the throughput to make this work, or is this more about Comcast? I mean, who do you think in this kind of dispute that now it seems to be settled between the two companies, who do you think might have been to blame for the poor service? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd love to uh, recommend everyone read Dan's piece. Incredibly detailed, incredibly well-informed, and it's just a great breakdown of the numbers, the dynamics, and, and everything about this. Um, I'm one of the few people who does have a choice, so I do benefit from being in a Comcast area, but also a Verizon Fios user. I think Dan has some better numbers on this, but my understanding is that Verizon is not as aggressive as they used to be in rolling out Fios. In fact, in many areas, they're not even pushing it in any serious way. So I'm one of the lucky folks who have something above the base level of uh, Verizon Fios to get 25 megabits. So I haven't seen really any stalls, even though I've been binge-watching House of Cards, my kids are watching PBS on another thing, and um, I haven't seen that myself. So I, I think, you know, as, as Stacy said, you know, one of the things that most people don't have is choice. Um, and this is why we do need more choices out there, so that if you do have a situation where one provider is not lifting much of a finger to help alleviate the bottlenecks um, for their end users, you have another provider out there that provides that choice and puts the pressure on these folks to maybe look into solutions that um, that are 
out of the box or in Netflix's case using their box like their open connect hardware to alleviate some of these things so you know I'm quick to point out to folks that we're in really weird uncharted territory right the fact that Netflix is so unidirectional and pushing all the stuff out there that people are binge watching entire seasons um, between 8 p.m. and midnight and the internet was not architected for such a huge one-way flow of stuff and the agreements and the understandings of how these things flow are are having to change very quickly to accommodate these things so um, and this is what a third of all internet traffic um, in kind of prime time or evening comes from Netflix. I mean, that's that's unbelievable. Right. No. So not only volume, but very narrow slices of time. Right. So it's just in the evening hours in the U.S. you get 32 percent or something around there uh, of all internet traffic is Netflix stuff flowing. So I think um, as Dan and Stacy pointed out, it because these this agreement that um, Netflix and Comcast just signed is not guaranteeing service all the way to the end user. It really doesn't touch that last mile in terms of saying, um, oh, Google, you get this slow lane, and Netflix, you get this fast lane. It really does not have an effect on the net neutrality debate at that level. But if you look at some people um, looking at this problem further upstream at the interconnect level, um, if there are things that Verizon or Comcast or any large provider of that last mile can um, do at the interconnect level, it has implications in terms of how those services come off the end user, even if they are not last mile issues. And what do you think, Felix? Um, bringing you into the discussion, do you think this is, do you think this is something that's been a little bit overblown in the press, or do you think there really are some concerns around it, or is this just you know a business deal that just happens to you know help both companies and consumers? So a couple of points. Firstly, the timing of the announcement, um, in a weird way, couldn't have been worse for Comcast because it came more or less at exactly the same time as the announcement they were going to buy Time Warner Cable. So everyone was already very upset about the Time Warner Cable thing, um, and we already had a whole bunch of com conversations about whether that was monopolistic and and so on and so forth. And then this thing comes along, and all the same, and 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 question the difference between the two things is a subtle distinction and people aren't paying so much attention with the exception of Dan that they really understand the difference and it all just comes it comes in as a kind of Comcast is eating the world you know and it's evil and it's extracting money it's buying Time Warner Cable and it's extracting money from Netflix and it's just this huge giant and it's CEO plays golf with Obama and you know and and we are all living in Comcast world and there's nothing that the rest of us can do about it and they're just going to eat us all and extract rents from all of us and and in you know take over the world so that that's the er uh, narrative and you can you know you can do what Dan does and start like picking nits and say well this is you know it, it's not a, it's not a, it's about peering it's not about night all of these decisions which does a whole bunch of things including being an ISP including being a cable provider um, you have and by the way this is also important that the the Comcast actually qua cable provider doesn't like Netflix because Netflix is actually an alternative to cable. So that's a whole other sort of layer of, of why these two companies don't like each other in the first place. Um, and you know, and, and so all of that come all all of that sort of general dislike, no one in the world likes their cable provider and certainly no one with Comcast likes their likes their cable <laughs> provider. So so you Except know it's, so, so it'll, it's just an excuse for all of this stuff to come out and frankly Comcast is too big and it is a monopolist and it will be even more of a of a monopolist after after it buys Time Warner Cable. And you know, this deal you know, it's probably good for Comcast consumers, but it does show the power of this big, you know, quasi-evil company. And, you know, streaming is hard. I, you know, just literally over the past few minutes, I've heard Mark sort of stutter out a bit. I, I saw Dan sort of like freeze for a while. You know, Google is a big and, you know, quasi-evil company itself at this point, and it can't get streaming right, you know, with these Google Hangouts. And Netflix is much bigger, and it's a much harder problem to not, not to crack. So I have sympathy for the engineers who are trying to make this thing work. But at the same time, you know, I think the, the big story here, and it's important to keep a little bit of, of focus on the big story, the big story is, is just, oh, my God, Comcast, how just 
completely world-eatingly big as is this company. <laughs> do you think that, Dan? I mean, what, do you do you? I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to this than just about peering and throughput and things like that. There's there's this kind of view of Comcast as Felix said, is quasi-evil, <laughs> or evil by, I'm sure, a lot of people, um, because they had such poor service. Um, you know, do you, do you take that into account when you look at the way people view Comcast in this deal? Well, in this deal, no. I mean, I think what we're coming down to here is a bigger idea of, do people not like their cable company because they raise rates every year? Yes. Do people want a lot of choices in the market, and do we, probably all of us as consumers, think that the more choices there are in the market, the better we are? Absolutely. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. There are certain instances where fewer choices in the market because of economics of scale will actually help you as a consumer, but I've been very vocal that when I think about the streaming days back in you know 2000 when you had Microsoft and you had real networks, there were a lot more choices in the market. They wanted to compete so much with each other that there was more advancements made with the technology, the underlying technology in those years than there has been in the past couple of years because there were more competitors wanting to compete with one another. So I wouldn't use the, the term evil. I have Verizon Fios. I love what I get for 100 bucks a month, 50 megs, unlimited calls. I get great quality TV. I get free HBO and Showtime. <laughs> the best 100 bucks I can spend. So It should be I sponsoring you. <laughs> I don't think my cable company is evil. Um, if I think about what I'd have to spend to get all of that content, especially because I'm a huge Mets fan, I can't get local sports any other way. It's blacked out on MLB TV. So for me, cable makes a lot of sense. There's certainly plenty of others out there who it doesn't make sense for them to be paying $100 a month. What do you think, Stacy, about, about that? Um, that you, know, you talked about Comcast power, and this is about kind of growing power. What, what about the time where deal. Uh, does this impact that at all? I mean, a lot of people have talked about it, and we talked about the Time Warner deal on the podcast before. We talked a lot about how it was about, you know, two big cable companies coming together, but really this, they would own together, what, 60% of the broadband uh, connections in the U.S. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's a huge, huge amount. I don't think it's quite 60% of the broadband connections, um, okay. but it, it is a huge, it, it would be about I think a bit less than a third, which is still significant. Um, okay. It's, it's about, and they're probably going to divest in some markets. We don't know which markets, but it's like 30, it's about 30 million. It's the same in line with the PTV. I, I would say a couple, there's a couple points to make here. One is the big story actually, so maybe from Felix's perspective, the big story is that Comcast is evil. Uh, and I, I will probably not argue against Comcast being evil, but the, the real story for the technologist side is how are we going to deliver video over the internet the way it's built today? And this isn't necessarily a show about that, but that's kind of part of the backstory of this deal and why people like myself who have been covering this are kind of upset because it, it shows how the internet kind of power dynamics and technological, like the way it's built, is changing. Um, the, and, and this is I don't know if it's an indictment against the big guys, but between Google and Amazon and Netflix, uh, they carry about 65% of all of the web traffic. Is that the latest? I think that's the latest data from uh, Craig Lugowitz over at Deep Field. Um, he calls them hypergiants. And so you've got them on one side, and then you've got the ISPs on the other. And they're basically directly connecting. So the internet itself is flattening out. And we're not sure what that's going to mean. So Netflix signing this deal was one of the big hypergiants basically acceding to the fact that they're going to have to pay to peer directly with Comcast and Comcast saying, yes, let's make this happen. So, I don't know, those are, those are the two big stories from my perspective. How to deliver video and then what does it mean that the internet is flattening out for smaller players? And also, we always thought about, like you said, Netflix and Comcast have had, you know, Netflix is about cutting the cord and not being part of cable, and Comcast is about protecting cable for as long as it will live. Is this maybe also a, um, on the part of Comcast saying, look, you know, the reality is that cable might not, you know, who knows what will happen to cable long term, but broadband, you know, that probably will not ever go away, or at least in our lifetime. So, you know, maybe this is just a bet by Comcast to say, 
hey, eventually maybe you will get to buy Xfinity as a, you know, as some sort of broadband plus content service without having your cable. I mean, maybe I assume that somewhere in, you know, Comcast they've been thinking about what's going to happen if, you know, this cable cutting thing does, does take place. They totally have. That's why they, they bought NBC Universal. Um, but you, you can see, like, with the Time Warner, for example, Glenn Britt, the former CEO of Time Warner, he's been very, very, like, vocal about how Netflix is good for his bottom line because it, it gets people to subscribe to faster broadband. He's also one of the few cable companies that doesn't have a cap on broadband access because that's important. Um, Comcast, I think, is playing it a little bit more, if you're a Wall Street analyst, better. They're playing it better. They're, they're much more financially astute. They, they bought a content company. Uh, they have a cap, to, but it's a high cap, so you can still get your Netflix and you're not like really, really upset over it. So I think Comcast is well aware that that's the future, and I think they're both innovating on the content and delivery side, as well as trying to forestall the inevitable cannibalization of the pay to business. What do you think, Andrew? Where do you think uh, Comcast stands here at the moment? Well, I, I think that you know Dan made a pretty good argument because you really don't have direct numbers about how much money is changing hands here or what the exact agreement looks like. But but Dan's numbers look pretty good in terms of his rationale. So as you mentioned before, Cogent has a history of kind of overselling what um, it promises. So not exactly the best partner to have when you depend on your video getting to these end users. The other thing that he talked about was if you look back in the previous older days of Netflix, they were using like Amazon Web Services or depending on a lot of third-party high-end CDN providers and they would help you make sure you're getting those connections that made uh, the last mile delivery reliable. But because they're now rolling their own, you know, they're trying to squeeze more out of every single subscriber. They're trying to make their own CDN. Um, it hasn't been optimized. So they're still trying to find a way to get that out there. And then I think the number that you spit out, Dan, which, correct me if I'm wrong, was around 12 million is what you estimate as how much Netflix is paying. Is that right? Or what was the number no, you came up with? No, I'm not putting a number out there. What I did on the blog is put, here's the pricing for transit, which you can use as an example, mm -hmm. and then here's how much capacity they need. Now, whether you want to use 70 cents as your transit number or 50 cents or 40 cents, that's really up to the reader to figure that out, but I'm not actually quoting a specific number, otherwise everybody will just misquote me. <laughs> but it's in the tens of millions, it's not 400 million is what you concluded. Right? Exactly, it's, it's well under 20 million per year. Right. right, and that's pretty significant because a lot of weird numbers out there seem to think that Netflix has to really pay a lot to get the service that you're seeing. Right, right. Do you think, I mean, Felix, do you think this impacts Netflix as far as, you know, their business? Does this mean their business costs are going up, down, sideways, or just hard to tell because it's not transparent? Oh, no. This does, this does not impact the business of Netflix in the slightest. No. I mean, the, the, the business of Netflix is a whole different conversation which we can have, um, and it's entirely a function of the cost of content. It has nothing to do with... You don't think transit and serving their content would cost would cost that much? No, it doesn't. It, Netflix, it doesn't. Okay. yeah, Netflix is probably paying less for transit via Comcast than it probably is through than it was through Cogen or other providers. In it, all it, it definitely is. There's no it, question. Also, in two thousand in two thousand two, Netflix spent about fifty million dollars worldwide to deliver all their content. Eleven in two thousand eleven to two thousand and twelve, about fifty million dollars. Um, and if you think about, they're spending just house you know, cards. three billion dollars a year um, just on content licensing this year alone. This this is nothing in terms of overall cost. So there was more of an overreaction to it on Wall Street, you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but because unfortunately Wall Street said, okay, if they're paying fifty million dollars to Comcast, and they're going to have to pay another fifty million to Verizon and fifty million to Time Warner, what they're missing is. Verizon's network and number of subs is, you know, 25% of what Comcast has. So obviously they're not going to pay the same amount, and the amount that people are using is wrong to begin with. So um, Wall Street definitely overreacts. But then again, when doesn't Wall Street overreact? <laughs> it's kind of the way the way that Wall Street works. Um, Felix, did you have any other thoughts about just this deal in general and the Time Warner cable deal? Do you think that this might impact the way regulators look at that deal? 
at all, or do you think that deal will, will possibly just sail through with a few concessions? I, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to try and second guess the competition authorities on on Comcast Time Warner Cable. I don't, it, you know, that's I'm bad at that. <laughs> I generally get those things wrong. Um, but what I will say is that it has reopened the argument about this thing called local loop unbundling, where you know the last mile doesn't. Own, isn't owned wholly by Verizon or Comcast or you know just a single company who basically can charge whatever they like because there's there's no real competition because if you're like me you know, Verizon has been promising FiOS for the past five years and hasn't got around to installing it yet um, the it, all you need to do is, is implement local loop unbundling and that solves a huge number of problems at one stroke and the chances of that happening are exactly zero, but you know, with any luck, the that that might come back on the agenda. That's that's the only the only thing I'm vaguely hoping for here. It was more of an a la carte approach to pay TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I wonder both Stacy and Dan, since you're the you know active reporters on this, is are we just kind of doomed to always repeat these cycles of we need two thousand words to explain to you folks why the sky's not falling and. Something yeah. like this. It, oh, oh, that's really depressing. But um, <laughs> you know, I mean, is Reality. there any way to get to the public that you know? So when these kinds of things happen, the net neutrality purists don't come out and say, "Ah, this is the end of the world," and Wall Street panics. And is there a simple way to just kind of express the way things are going, or is it just you need to understand all the ins and outs? You need to understand a lot of them. I mean, keep in mind we're talking about obviously complex issues. Um, you know, I would always say to someone to, to that, you know, can you get your mom or dad to figure out how to use their DVR? Um, so we're talking about technology that, that's out there that's very simple that a lot of people can't use, let alone the behind the scenes working. You know, Stacy's point she made earlier is really the heart of this, this discussion from a technology standpoint, which is it's still almost 20 years later very hard to deliver video on the Internet because what people want to argue with every single day, it seems, is they think that the internet is a broadcast distribution medium just like TV is, and it's not. And it can't support the type of quality video we get on TV at the type of, of subscription numbers that TV has. And that's not going to change five years from now, and it's not going to change ten years from now. It's always going to get better, but it can't compete with traditional broadcast TV in terms of the means of distribution. Yes, Stacey, did you want to jump into? I, I sort of disagree. I do think that, like, I talk to startups and even big companies every day who are innovating around codecs, they're innovating around, like, uh, different peering, transparent caching. I mean, like, all these wonky technology kind of solutions um, to improve video streaming because everyone... I have a seven-year-old daughter, and the other day she turns to me in the car and she's like, Mom, I do not like that kind of TV where you have to watch things when they're on. And that is, that is, that's the future, is my <laughs> daughter. Um, maybe it's, it's people watching what they want when they watch. And that's, that's going to be an IP-based delivery model. And, and it is feasible, and it will be cost-effective. I will say that I'm concerned about this deal from the standpoint that Netflix, among others, has been working really hard to, to squeeze as, many, as much of the cost out of this process as possible in innovating on a bunch of other areas. In now with Comcast getting in the middle there, Comcast doesn't have the same incentive as Netflix to innovate here because they have this existing captive pay TV audience. So I'm a little concerned about that, but I, I do have faith in like Silicon Valley and innovation and kind of looking their way around this. What about the reporting on it? Like Andrew was saying, you know, we there was a lot of reports that came out that were inaccurate. I mean, that's something I guess we just expect with tech blogs at the moment. I don't expect it. Um, I would say <laughs> this is a hard topic. I mean, this is not, I mean, if I were reporting on, like, social media metrics, I'd be just as out of my league. And there's not a lot of people dedicated to covering the actual Internet and who understand how the Internet works. And I give, I give people credit. Like, I thought, I think, I'm going to say I thought it was unfair that you yelled at people for not knowing how to do trace routes because that's not, something, that's not something people do. I mean, I spent all week in learning it. Right, but it should be. It should be if they're going to report on a topic and talk about what's actually taking place from a technology standpoint, 
they either have to do two things, either learn to do the trace route or talk to network engineers who build networks for a living. I'm no network engineer. I don't have a background in engineering, so that's why even I spoke to multiple network engineers who build this stuff so they know. A reporter can't necessarily, like a reporter who doesn't cover this can't suddenly call up a network engineer. I, I've covered this for 10 plus years, and even I like have only like six or seven network engineers that I can reach like on a dime. So I, I just, it's a hard issue. I think people maybe overstated it, but that happens all the time. Why hasn't the media overstated something anymore? Yeah, it's it's it worth saying. Well, the, the the communication from from Comcast and Netflix was, let's say, um, less than crystal clear when it came to this whole thing. You know, we had to kind of work it out ourselves because they weren't they weren't telling us very clearly what they were doing. Well, no, they, I, no, that's well, that's that's not true at all. They actually came out and said this is a commercial. They use the term commercial to mean peering. Interconnection. They use the word commercial to mean peering. Okay. Thank I mean, you. Sorry, that. sorry. Um, they, <laughs> sorry, I said that wrong. They use the word commercial to explain that it's a relationship involving payment. It's not free. So I actually. Yeah, but, but why? I, I mean, they didn't get into the minute details of what was going no, on and no, what they, they said. It. And I mean, and I did, I did invite both Netflix and Comcast to join us, and they declined as they usually do. Um, so I, you know, I don't know that they're being super upfront about things typically. But isn't, but isn't the most important thing is to the regulators, and that, as Dan said, you know, if if Comcast can walk up to the regulators and say, "Hey, the only thing this is is a peering agreement," and you regulators know what that is, this is not a violation of anything related to net neutrality. That's all that really matters in the end, in terms of whether the Time Warner deal or anything else happens in the future, right? Of course, the bad PR doesn't help, as Felix said. But in the end, the regulators know what this means and the enormity or not of this deal. Right? True. Well, thanks, guys. It was an interesting discussion, and I think uh, hashing it out like this at least brings a little bit more clarity to it because it is a complicated issue, and appreciate the knowledge that both Dan and Stacy have on the topic. It's good to have people with that kind of background to help the rest of us out in, as far as understanding the issues. I want to thank uh, our guests in the whole roundtable, including uh, Andrew Lee from American University, Clara Grodin, MediaTwits intern, Dan Rayburn from Streaming Media Blog, uh, Felix Salmon from Reuters, Stacy Higginbotham from GigaOM, and we'll catch you each and every week on Fridays here at MediaTwits at MediaShift at pbs.org slash MediaShift. I'll be off next week, but I will leave you in the capable hands of Andrew Lee as our host next week. We'll catch you then. Take care, everyone.